Please rise. Our sermon text this morning is taken from John's Gospel, continuing where we left off last week in John 21, verses 1 through 19. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he, was revealed, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And although there were so many... The net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So far the word of our Lord. We pray. Lord, to whom else shall we go and whom else shall we follow? You have the words of eternal life. Amen. My brother Matt and I like to trick people sometimes. At least we used to, on the phone. See, nobody seems to be able to tell us apart. Somebody would call Matt, I'd answer the phone and pretend to be him. We'd even pass it back and forth, and nobody could ever tell. Mom couldn't tell. Dad couldn't tell. Our wives, Rachel and Vanessa, couldn't tell the difference. Now, I suppose that eventually we wouldn't be able to keep the ruse up. You know, probably not for that long. We never tried to do it for that long. We just laugh after a few minutes and, and tell them what we've been doing. See, he's as similar as our voices and our speech patterns might be. We're not the same person, and we don't know all the same things. And eventually, somebody that knows us well is going to be able to tell the difference, right? Because there are many ways to tell someone that you know, besides for how they look or the sound of their voice. If you're looking at them from afar off, maybe you can tell by the way they walk. You ever done that where you can tell who someone is just from the type of gait that they have? Maybe you can tell from kinds of things that they say or from shared remembrances. You know, like in some movie where they're not sure if that person's really who they say, then they say, what did I say to you on such and such a date? Or where did we go on our first date? Or, or whatever it is. It's the same with Jesus and the disciples in our text. He reveals himself to them, but not by sight. Now John makes a point of, of saying this. Jesus revealed himself to the disciples in this way, he says in verse 1. And one of the interesting things about all the resurrection appearances of Jesus is that no one appears to be, recognize him, at least not at first, not by sight. Mary doesn't. The two Emmaus disciples walk seven miles with him and they don't recognize him. When he appears in the upper room, they're all, they're all afraid and they kind of doubt that it's Jesus. And they're like, is this a ghost? They don't really know what's going on. 
And so it is here as well. The disciples do not recognize him by sight. Now, at first, I suppose you could say, well, that's just because they're out in the boat. You know, the sun's just pulled itself up over the horizon, and it's glinting off the little lake waves, tracing a path to the shore, and the unknown figure standing there. They're not going to be able to see him from 100 yards off. But even later, when they stand around him for breakfast, verse 12 points out that none of them dared ask him if he was, who he was because they knew he was the Lord. So they know that it's Jesus, but not through sight. So verse 12 is pointing out that he doesn't look the same, but he is the same. He's the same teacher and friend they had spent the last three years with, the same Savior who had groaned on the cross for them for three hours. The same Lord who, after being buried in the belly of the earth for three days, had sprang forth in victory. He was their same Jesus and yours. And that is both a mighty comfort and a mighty calling. So how did the disciples recognize Jesus, if not by sight? Uh, there is an old song written in 1938, but it's still quite popular throughout all these ages. It's called, I'll Be Seeing You. Maybe you know it. And I think the reason that it remains fairly popular is because it's eminently relatable. People in 1938, 1939, the, the years that were to follow who were separated by the war that was about to spread across the world would find in that song an easy favorite. And you, if, if you've ever lost someone to death or to distance, can likely relate to the lyrics as well. It goes, I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places, and it goes on to list some of those familiar places. And it's just like that that Jesus reveals himself to the disciples. Not through sight, not even through the way he sounds, but through the old familiar things that they had known and done with him. See, this miracle that he performs is just filled with references to other things that he had done and said with his disciples. First is the fact that they're back at Galilee. It says Sea of Tiberias. That's another name for the Sea of Galilee. Their old stopping grounds, their old familiar place where they grew up and where they had spent so much time with Jesus. And while they're there, while they're waiting for Jesus, Peter goes back to his old familiar craft. Let's go fishing, he says, and they all go along. And the results are familiar because the last time they went fishing, they didn't catch anything. Luke 5 tells us that the disciples went out fishing all night long and they caught nothing, just like happens in our text. And in Luke 5, in the morning, Jesus was standing there. And he said to them, cast out your nets into the deep for a catch of fish. And Peter says, we've been fishing all night, we haven't caught anything. But because he said so, I'll give it a try. And they have a catch of fish so big that the nets are breaking and they have to call over the other boat to bring it in. So when Jesus again appears on the shore in the morning and says, cast your nets on the right side of the boat, and they fill up with a miraculous catch of fish, the deja vu is unmistakable. And John recognizes Jesus right then in all the old familiar things. And he tells Peter. Now when Peter realizes that it's Jesus, he puts on his outer garment because, well, you don't want to be standing half naked before, before your Savior, and he jumps into the sea. This is not the first time that Peter has stepped out of a boat to come to Jesus. But it appears that this time Peter doesn't really care whether he's going to walk on the water or just swim. He only cares about being with him. Deja vu again is unmistakable. And then, when the disciples come into shore, after they've had a long, hard night and a long row back into shore with this huge net of fish that they can hardly pull, Jesus is prepared. He always knows the needs of his people, and there he has fish and bread prepared for them. He takes the bread and he gives it. And again, it had to be deja vu for the disciples. Because... It was near these very shores where Jesus had once fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. And time and time again, Jesus had stood with his disciples and taken bread and broken it and given it to them in various ways and at various times and for various reasons, but always to provide. He was showing them that even if he didn't look the same, yes, he was still their same Lord, their same Savior, the one who came here even, even to serve them. Now, that's one really interesting note about this. Jesus once said, The Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now in his glory, what do we find him doing? Serving the disciples, giving them breakfast. He's the same he always was. His glory, his power, his, his rise hasn't changed him one bit, except in the way that he looks. Then 
he also emphasizes to Peter one more familiar thing, one more way in which he was the same. He shows Peter that he was still the same Lord whom Peter had denied. And he does that first with the fire. That's an odd detail for the Holy Spirit to include, the charcoal fire. And at first, I would just skip right over it, but it turns out that there's only one other place in the Bible where this word is used, and it's in John 18, when Peter stood in the court of the temple, warming his hands in the dark, cold night around a charcoal fire, and denied his Savior three times. Then here, when Jesus confronts him with that denial, there's the fire. And then Jesus speaks to Peter, and he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And in that first phrase, the key, the key phrase is more than these. He means the other disciples. Do you remember what Peter had said that night before he had denied Jesus? He said, even if everyone else denies you, I never will. He was lifting himself up above them. He believed that he did love Jesus more than the other disciples. But now he's been humbled. And he responds simply, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, this doesn't come through in our English translation, but Peter does not use the same word for love that Jesus does. Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I am your friend. I phileo you. Agape love is primarily that perfect love which God has for us. Phileo just means the love of friendship, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Peter isn't willing to claim the same level of love for Jesus that Jesus has for him. Jesus asks him again, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? This time he drops off the more than these. And Peter says again, Lord, you know that I am your friend. And the third time Jesus says, Simon, son of John, are you my friend? This time he uses the same word that Peter had been using. And that's why it says that Peter was grieved. It's kind of a double whammy. Not only because Jesus has you now dropped down and said, are you even my friend? But also because it's the third time. Again, Jesus is, is poking into that wound. You know, there's this elephant in the room between the two of them. Jesus, Peter denied Jesus. Jesus knows it. Peter knows it. They both know the other knows it. What do you do in situations like that? Kind of stand awkwardly, talk about the weather or sports or anything other than what happened, right? Not Jesus. He goes right into it. He specifically reminds Peter of how he had denied him, just like Jesus told him he would. But he doesn't do this just to be a meanie. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians that godly grief produces repentance for salvation. Jesus grieves in order to comfort. He afflicts in order to bind up and heal, in order to speak forgiveness. He was teaching Peter a lesson. See, Jesus was the same as always. The same teacher and friend and savior he had always been. But Peter was not the same. Peter had learned the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach. He had learned not to trust in himself or in his love for Jesus. He knew now that he would never have a perfect love for Jesus, not the kind of love that Jesus had for him. And he knew now that it didn't matter whether his love was greater than anyone else's because love for Jesus isn't a matter for comparison. Peter had been humbled. He had been grieved and afflicted, but now he was also comforted. See, on those shores by that fire, no longer in the dark of night, but now in the dawn of redemption, to him who had thrice denied, Jesus spoke a threefold absolution. After all, that is what he's doing when he says, feed my lambs and tend my sheep. He's restoring Peter to his office. Say, yes, Peter, you are still my disciple. You are still my apostle. I still want you to do what I have been calling you to do which is implied absolution. I have forgiven you. You are my friend. I'm still the same Jesus. And he says the same to you and me. To you and me who have also denied Jesus because we have not loved him perfectly. We never do. And any time we fail to love Jesus perfectly, we are denying him. You know, I often hear people talk about loving God. I was having a conversation once with, with a friend of mine from high school who I don't think he goes to church anymore. And he was in support of gay marriage and, and the gay rights movement and stuff. And he was just saying, well, I just don't understand how it can be wrong because I have some friends who, who are homosexual and they, they love God. You hear people say that a lot. Well, they just love God. You know, as long as somebody loves God. But do they love God? Do we love God? 
Is that the important question? Do you love God? If it is, we're all in big trouble. Jesus said that same night, night of Monday, Thursday, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's the test. That's the line. If you don't keep all of his commandments perfectly at every moment, you don't love Jesus. Not the way that you are supposed to. And that's what Peter has learned. He refuses to say, yes, Lord, I agape you. Because he doesn't have that kind of love. And neither do you and neither do I. So often we fail to keep Jesus' commandments. So, fail we fail, so often we fail to even bother to find out what they are and how they apply to our life. So often because we would rather do the things that we want to do and don't want to change, not for Jesus and not for someone else, not to do the things that other people want to do. And then even when we do keep Jesus' commandments, sometimes we do it out of love for ourselves so we can pat ourselves on the back and look down on other people and say, hey, I love God more than you do. Just as Peter had previously done. Now you and I need to learn Peter's lesson. Every day we need to be not the same. Jesus is the same, but every day you need to be different. You need to repent of who you were, of who you are by nature, of who we all are by nature, of that sinful flesh, and turn to Jesus, to throw ourselves on him, to say, Lord, you know all things. You know that I am your friend. And we're not his friends because we've proved ourselves perfectly faithful to him, but because of his perfect love for us. His love which never changes. Jesus is reminding us that he is the same. That our sins haven't changed him. That our rejection and denial of him has not turned his love away. He speaks to you no matter how many times you sin against him and fail to keep his commandments. He speaks to you forgiveness. I am still the same, Jesus says. Your savior, your friend, your God. What a mighty comfort that is. So come with the disciples and stand on the shores of Galilee and know Jesus, not by faith, not by sight, sorry, but by faith. Know him in the old familiar things. Know him in his familiar word and sacrament. Know him in his forgiving call, his comfort. Your sins are forgiven. And then hear his mighty call. You know, one of the things that Jesus was trying to remind the disciples of, one of the old familiar things, was what he had been calling them to do all along. Isn't it nice when things come full circle, when the end of a thing is parallel to the beginning? The disciples have now been in Jesus' traveling seminary for three years, and they've come full circle. It was at this lake, on these shores, maybe even in these very boats, where Jesus had first called them and said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And at that call, they'd left their nets and their boats and their businesses and followed Jesus. Now, he's come back to them for one last lesson. To sum everything up, to remind them of what he had taught them, to remind them that because he was still the same, and the comfort of forgiveness was still the same, so too his call to them, his mission for them, was still the same as well. And really, everything about the miracle seems to be intended to make that point. It's undeniable that the first time Jesus called the disciples and had the miracle of the catch of fish, he used it as an example of the call he was giving them. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. You used to be fishers of fish, now you're going to be fishing men. In this miracle, Jesus makes many of the same points. It was his word and his power which granted them success. They worked all night and didn't manage anything by themselves, but when Jesus told them where to cast the nets, then he filled them with fish. And so what will be Jesus' word, which will grant them success as they proclaim his resurrection to an unbelieving world? It was Jesus who filled those nets with fish, and it will be Jesus who will fill their churches with men and women. It was Jesus who did not allow the nets to break, and it will be Jesus who will not allow his word to fail. It was Jesus who provided for them breakfast on the shore. And it will be Jesus who will give them daily bread as they proclaim his peace to the world. Especially in this conversation with Peter, Jesus reminds us what the call still is today. Three times he says to him, if you love me, feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. Feed my sheep. That call was given to the apostles in the highest sense. They were called to shepherd the flock of God until the end of time, and they do. Through the word that they preach, which is recorded for us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, they continue to shepherd us, to feed us with the best grass and water that there is. Pastors and teachers, 
are given this same call. To shepherd the lambs that Christ purchased with his own blood. To preach his word. To give them his sacraments. To love them the way that Jesus did, or at least to try to. And to do for all of them what Jesus did for Peter. To preach law and gospel. To afflict and to comfort. To bind up and to heal. But it's not just called pastors either. It's, it's all Christians and their vocations. What precious lambs of the Savior has Jesus placed in your care? Children, parents, brothers and sisters, friends, co-workers, the lonely kid at school, the struggling single mother next door. What opportunities he gives to you. And so many ways that you can do it. For one thing, you do it through me. You've called me to shepherd the flock of God on your behalf. And whenever I do, you're, you're doing it through me. And you can call me to come and visit someone. You can call me to come and bring the word. You can bring someone to hear that word. And you also continue to shepherd the flock of God through your prayers. Prayers for the whole church and prayers for our missionaries in foreign lands and prayers for me and for the ministry of the word here. And through your offerings, which go to support that gospel ministry. And that's not all. At home, parents shepherd Jesus' own little lambs, teaching them the catechism, reading them Bible stories, praying and singing with them. You can shepherd the Savior's lambs by sitting with a lonely or healing or dying parent or grandparent, bringing them the comfort of Jesus' word. Or what about a coworker or a schoolmate? You can confess your ever the same, never dying Jesus to a world that is always awash in change and in death. And desperately needs to see Jesus and all the old familiar things in his word and sacrament. The truth is that there will never be no one for you to care for. There will never be no sheep for you to tend. I think the disciples went out on the lake because they had nothing better to do. They were waiting for Jesus. And so they figured they might as well go fishing, and that's fine. Jesus told them to go to Galilee and wait for him there. But soon he would ascend, and soon he would pour out his spirit upon them, and soon they would never again have nothing better to do. Their lives would be filled with following Jesus, following him by feeding his sheep, and following him into death. That's what Jesus foretold for Peter. He said, when you are old, someone else will dress you and take you where you do not want to go, foretelling what kind of death he would die in according to church tradition, and it's pretty reliable stuff. Peter was crucified. Upside down, though because he didn't think he was worthy to be crucified the same way his Savior was. Jesus calls you and I to the same. Never, not necessarily crucified, crucifixion. He calls us to follow him, though, the way that the apostles did. To realize that never will we have anything better to do than to love Jesus by caring for his sheep. And if we ever think we don't have the time, make it. And if you ever think you don't have the opportunities, remember all the people that Christ has already placed into your life need the shepherd's care. This is what he has called you to in your various situations and in your various vocations. Shepherd the flock of God to follow him, to follow him in feeding his sheep, to follow him even unto death as he had called Peter, to follow him in life. As Jesus said, because I live, you will live also. This is your same Jesus. And 2,000 years later, his same call still sounds. Follow me. They say that war changes people, and I can believe it. I was reading a book about a little girl in France whose father had gone away to world, the First World War. He'd come back alive, but he wasn't the same. The loving father had been replaced by a man who had no joy in life, no time or love for his daughters, and no comfort but alcohol. What he had seen and experienced and done in the war had simply been too much for him. It had changed him very much for the worse. When Jesus stands on the shore with his disciples that morning, he too has come back from war. On the cross, he had experienced the most gruesome, the most terrible of all battles. He must have felt all the pains and agonies and atrocities of all the wars of mankind. He bore all the guilt. He was beaten and brutally wounded and cruelly killed and crushed, and he died and in dying, death died, and Jesus rose. Still the same as ever. He was no different. 
might have looked different in his glory, but he was still the same one incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, the same friend of his people, the same one who miraculously provides for all of our needs, the same one who speaks comfort and peace and the forgiveness of sins, and the same one who calls us every day to follow him. What good news it is to know Jesus and all the old familiar things, to remember that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is risen. What a mighty comfort. What a mighty calling. Amen.